So far we talked about consumer surplus, whose graphical interpretation is the area below the demand curve and above the price line. Producer surplus, whose graphical interpretation is the area above the supply curve and below the price line. Now I want to talk about social surplus, which is the sum of consumer surplus and producer surplus. This is what economists care about. Economists in general don't aren't particularly interested in the welfare of either consumers or producers, rather the welfare of the entire society. So consumers plus producers combined. And uh, uh, graphically, I think this is a pretty clear. Draw it over here. If let's say this is the price line, then if you take consumer surplus, which is the area below the demand curve and above the price line, and producer surplus, which is the area above the supply curve and below the price line, and you add them together, what, what you end up getting is just the area between the supply curve and the demand curve. So the whole area between the supply curve and the demand curve is represents social surplus. And here's the reason. The demand curve, that height represents the maximum amount of money that consumers would be willing and able to pay for it. So that's its value to consumers, given their income. If they're really poor, then of course they can't express a high value because they don't have a lot of money. And what it costs, the minimum amount of money that it costs society to make it is given by the supply curve. So that's why it's socially valuable to produce stuff, because the value to society is bigger than the amount that it's actually going to cost society to make. So in this larger diagram, the gap between the supply curve and the, the demand curve and the supply curve represents the amount of social surplus. Now, if you are over on the right hand side, you would have a problem. Okay, because here, the cost to society of producing it is this, and the benefit to society of it is less. So this is actually representing negative social surplus. So those units of the commodity shouldn't be produced. So here I'd like to ask the following question. Suppose you're a social planner. So you don't care about consumer surplus per se, nor do you care about producer surplus per se. You care about social surplus. And as a social planner, you can decide how much Q gets produced in the society. How much Q would you want society to produce? Would you want it to produce this much Q, or this much Q, or this much Q? Or this? How much? What's the, what's the number? And the way you go about answering this question is start from Q equals zero and ask, well, is it worthwhile to produce a little bit? And the answer is yes, because if you produce a little bit over here, the, the units that you've been producing all have a value over up here, which is bigger than its cost. They all have a positive social surplus. So is it worthwhile producing over here? Well, yes, because all those, all those points also have values that are bigger than their costs. How about the place where supply equals demand? How about there? Do that in a different color. Well, all those units also have a positive amount of social surplus. Should you go, so you, so you should go here. Should you go here? Should you go more? No, because if you go more, then you get into this area where social surplus is negative. And so if you wanted to maximize social surplus, you wouldn't go there. The conclusion is that the, the optimal output from the point of view of a social planner who wants to maximize social surplus is this output, Q star. That's the optimal. It will not have escaped your attention that that is also what you'd get if you turn this industry over to a competitive, uh, competitive industry, if you turn this technology over to a competitive industry.
In other words, the competitive equilibrium is right where supply equals demand. And it generates the amount of output, Q star, which is exactly the amount of output which a social planner would pick if you could. This is a, one of the classic welfare results of, of perfect competition. Now, there are lots of assumptions that we've made throughout the whole semester in order to get to this point, so you shouldn't read too much into it. For example, one of the, uh, one of the fields that I spend a lot of time teaching is environmental economics, where there are externalities, where the production causes pollution, which hurts people, and so this is just part of the story, and it's certainly not the whole story. And uh, in that in that example, uh, the Q star that's socially op that's th that's the result of the competitive equilibrium is certainly not socially optimal. But in this the simple context that we have in this course, the competitive equilibrium Q star is actually the one that the social planner would pick. It's the social optimum, and so this is an echo of Adam Smith's invisible hand result that the competitive equilibrium is socially optimal. Now, the whole reason we went into this business of consumer surplus and producer surplus was to try to judge monopoly versus competition. And you already have a glimpse here that monopoly is not going to be so good. The monopolist is going to perceive the demand curve as being the average revenue curve. He's going to have a marginal revenue curve like this, and a monopolist doesn't have a supply curve. In fact, that's something I should have pointed out earlier. A monopolist has a supply point. Not a supply curve. The reason is that a supply curve answers the following question. If if price is such and such, how much is supplied? If price is a different amount, how much is supplied? If price is a different amount, how much is supplied? And that's what a supply curve is. You can't have a supply curve for a monopolist because the monopolist doesn't say, well, if the price is such and such, what do I do? The monopolist knows the demand curve, and so he knows that the price is going to be one particular point. He picks the price when he picks the quantity. It's along the demand curve that he knows about. So a monopolist has a supply point. You know what the monopolist does, demand, marginal revenue, marginal cost. The monopolist goes where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, and then he goes up to the demand curve, and that's, that's where the monopolist goes. He doesn't, um, he doesn't have a supply curve. Okay, so back in the graph, the monopolist doesn't have a supply curve, but this would be the monopolist marginal cost, and so the more or less the monopolist would go where MR equals MC and so his quantity would be here and his price would be over here. Now we're going to do this much more carefully in the only context in which it's really technically possible to do it with simple graphs and that's the context that we talked about several videos ago, ago with constant returns to scale. That is not this context and so I'm waving my hands here this isn't exactly right. All I want to give you here is the idea that the monopolist is not headed to Q star. The monopolist is going to end up going someplace like here, which isn't Q star, and that's going to be the essence of why economists say monopoly is bad, because monopoly is not going to maximize social surplus. So we will see that in the next video, in the proper context where we have constant returns to scale and we can do everything absolutely correctly. So as I said, the red marks here are not absolutely correct, but they just give you an impression of the notion that the monopolist isn't going to be going to Q star, which is where the social planner would want him to go.